Uh, well, thank you very much for those um, very kind words. And uh, we only met yesterday, but it's been one of the pleasures of the last uh, 36 hours uh, to, to get to know you as a friend. So thank you very much. Well, you all know the story. The story is of China's extraordinary rise over the last 30, 35 years. A country of 1.3 billion people growing at 10% a year um, for over 30 years. You know, in 1980, China was 1 20th of the size of the American economy. 1 20th, 5% of the size of the American economy. And since then, very recently, it's been very rapidly closing on the American economy. That was, uh, the Chinese economy in 2005 was about 40, just over 40% of the American economy. In 2011, the Chinese economy was about 86% of the size of the American economy. And this year, the World Comparison Program run by the World Bank announced that the Chinese economy would overtake the size of the American economy this year. It probably did it last month. Last month or this month. So now, for the first time for well over 100 years, the American economy is no longer the largest economy in the world. The Chinese economy is now the largest economy in the world. And because of this new situation, you know, because China's growth rate, even though it's now lower than it was, uh, the Chinese economy is projected by the IMF by 2019, which is um, five years away, just under five years away, will be 20% larger than the US economy. Now, it is fair to say, I think, that China is already a global economic power. The largest economy in the world, the biggest exporter in the world, shortly to be the biggest importer in the world. It's overseas investment growing very rapidly. China is already a big player in terms of the global economy. But China, I would argue, is certainly not yet a global power in the broad sense of the term. Not just economic, but politically, culturally, intellectually, ethically, morally, militarily, China is not at that point yet. That will take time. Oh, I would imagine that will uh, be a process that takes place over the next several uh, decades. But because China is such a huge country in terms of population, it's arrived at this point in a... In, in a situation where it's still in the middle of its economic takeoff, it's still in the middle of industrial revolution. So China's problem, I think, is it's going to be pushed into being a global power before it really wants to, before it's really ready to be that. But still, that is the reality of the situation. Now, what is China going to be like as a global power? I mean, that is, a, that is a difficult question, I would suggest. And it's a question which, surprisingly, given where China is this year, it's had very, very little discussion. Now, I think that probably, therefore, as a consequence, the reactions to the question are fairly knee-jerk, you know, because we haven't done our homework on this. And the knee-jerk reactions, well, one knee-jerk reaction, well, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be like the Soviet Union. Why? Because, you know, 
China's run by a Communist Party, the Soviet Union was run by a Communist Party. Now, forget that. The Soviet Union doesn't, I think, offer us any clues as to what China's going to be like as a great power. Because although the Soviet Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party both had Communist Party in their names, historically they have been, and they have been very, very different. And you'll see that when I return to this later. So I don't think that the Soviet Union, is, Soviet Union offers us any clues in relationship to this. Okay. Well, it's going to be like the United States. Why is it going to be like the United States? Well, because the United States is clearly a great global power, the global superpower of our time. And the fact is that, the argument would go, if you are a great global power, with the territory of going, being a great global power, goes lots of interests and so on. So China is, will be rather similar to the United States. Well, I'm not saying that it won't share any characteristics with the United States, but I don't think this is a correct way of looking at it either. Why? Why? Because it's not just about interests. It's about history, it's about background, it's about culture. Now, if, if, unless you think those things don't matter, then this is very important. And they, clearly, in my view, they are extraordinarily important to understand any country, but especially a country like China with such a long history, which, has, which is so historically aware of itself, then you have to take these factors into consideration. Indeed, they will, in important measure, shape the way in which China behaves and acts as a global power. So, I want to start at that point. I want to start at the historical point. Because I think it will offer us at least a point of departure, an insight into what China might be like as a global power. Now, when China was a great imperial country in its own time, um, the Middle Kingdom, it did share an important characteristic with Europe. They both had a sense of their own universalism, their own, as it were, ubiquity, their own um, omniscience in some senses. I wouldn't say that China regarded itself as a model for others, but it certainly regarded itself to be superior, insofar as they thought like that, superior to others. And Europe certainly saw itself like that. But there, the similarity between Europe and China ends. Because the way they interpreted this notion of universalism was very, very different. You see, Europe, with the great discoveries, the great uh, uh, discoveries around the world, rapidly became, as you know, a huge colonial force in the world. Europe interpreted its sense of universalism in the form of a desire to conquer the world, to rule the world, literally to rule the world through huge empires of which you know, my country uh, had uh, the largest. And to impose on these d distant peoples and distant cultures European values, European religion, European ways of doing things, and so on. I mean, I, I like this slide here. Oh. I recognize the back of that guy. I, I, I hope you can read this. It says... The 22 countries that Britain has not invaded. That is, that is a, a, a symbol, in a way, of just what Britain and other countries uh, of Europe, like France and Belgium and Germany and so on, were like in terms of the way in which they saw the world and the way in which they expanded across the world. Or, to put it another way, the European mentality was a conquer the world 
universalism. A conquer the world universalism. Now, what about China? Well, China was very, very different in the way it interpreted its universalism. The way China interpreted its universalism was that we are the middle kingdom. We are the land under heaven. We are the most advanced form of civilization. So why would we want to step outside China into darkening shades of barbarianism? What's, what is there to, to gain? I mean, you know, when, when uh, co the, the great colonial pioneers of Britain uh, went across the world, they were fated. If I, if I take you around British cities, you'll see in this st statue in this square and so on to the kind of great heroes of British colonialism. The Chinese had a completely different attitude. The emperor's attitude was, if you leave China, if you come down to these parts of the world, if you come to Southeast Asia, I'm sorry, you are stepping outside civilization and you are not deserving of the protection of the emperor. That was the traditional attitude in, um, in, 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 of, the, of the Middle Kingdom. So the, the, Chinese, the Chinese attitude was uh, very, very different um, to the European attitude. It, 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 put it like this, the Chinese attitude was a stay-at-home universalism. Not a conquer-the-world universalism, but a stay-at-home universalism. And you can see this, I mean, I, you remember, you, you may know this slide, but it's um, the, the ship in the background is Zhang He, who um, sailed uh, in the first 30 years of the 15th century to, uh, well, to East Africa, to uh, India, uh, East China Sea, West China Sea, and so on, in seven uh, great uh, voyages. But they were not the prelude to colonizing these uh, parts of the world. On the contrary, they, they left, and they left no permanent mark. Uh, they were more sort of designed, if you like, to celebrate China's, the, the achievements of Chinese uh, civilization, and they left uh, no permanent marks. By the way, just to draw your attention, the little dinghy in the front here is the one that everyone historically remembers. That's Christopher Columbus. <laughs> but I, I mean, in my country, you know, in most parts of the world, they've never heard of Zheng He, but everyone's heard of Christopher Columbus and the Santa Maria, which, by the way, it was 80 years later that he sailed in this. So just remember, history is, tends to be the history of the victors. So, now it, it's not, China did have an international order, which lasted thousands of years, and we've come to know it as the tributary system. Um, just to, I mean, basically, this is very rough and ready, but the tributary system, the tribute states uh, on and off were these states. But, China never conquered them. China didn't invade them. China didn't rule them. There were two expectations, essentially, the Chinese had of the tribute states. One was that they would pay due respect to the, to the emperor. And secondly, that they would acknowledge the superiority of Chinese culture. These were the two fundamental uh, expectations they had. It was a very hierarchical system and so on. So what can we say, historically speaking, about Europe on the one hand and China on the other? Well, on the one hand, Europe, was in t Europe became, as a, as a consequence of this conquer the world uh, universalism, Europe uh, relied very heavily on military and political uh, invasion and interference. On the con in contrast, the Chinese stay-at-home universalism relied on uh, essentially two main elements. One was economic, because the China was by far the most advanced econo economy uh, in this part of the world for a long, long period of time. And secondly, cultural. You know, pay due respect to the em emperor, except that Chinese culture is superior, and so on. So very historically, very contrasting. And this this contrast is reinforced by something else which is very important. You know, China's huge. Those four provinces today are larger than the United States. Those nine provinces colored are all the same size as or larger than the UK 
and France. China is huge, <coughs> diverse, and extremely difficult to govern. I mean, one of the extraordinary feats of governance of the last 2,000 years is that China today exists in a form which resembles what was created 2,000 years ago. But it comes at a cost. And the cost is that the most difficult problem always facing Chinese rulers down the ages from the imperial period and to up today with Xi Jinping and so on is how to maintain unity, order, and stability. They, you know, it's not like running Britain. It's not like running America. This is running what is today 20% of the world's population. So the preoccupation of China's rulers is not foreign escapades, foreign adventures. The preoccupation down the ages of Chinese rulers has been maintaining order and stability at home. So that also reinforces the point about the Chinese having a stay-at-home stay uh, universalism. Now, um, what, how do we interpret this for understanding uh, the, how, the, how China is likely to be as a great power and how it will contrast with the experience of Europe uh, and uh, the United States? Well, <clears throat> the first point to make is an important general point, which is that if you're going to become a great power, you've got to have, relatively speaking, at the time, a very strong and advanced economy. This is crucial. If, if you haven't got economic predominance or uh, near predominance, then you cannot be a great global power. So the great hegemons of the last 200 years, first Britain and then the United States, were largely preeminent economically, and China will be the same, although it, in the Chinese case, it's to do at the moment with the size of the economy rather than the advanced nature of the economy. But look at Britain. Think of it in these terms. Britain, the Britain's economy as a proportion of the global economy, in other words, as a proportion of global GDP, reached its peak in 1870, which was about 30 years after the Industrial Revolution, 40, 30, 30, 30 years after the Industrial Revolution finished. And at that point, it only represented 9% of the global economy. So as a fragment of the global economy, it was pretty small. Now, America was different. America reached uh, its zenith in terms of proportion of global GDP. I don't know whether, whether you could guess when it is, but it's actually 1950. That was its highest peacetime proportion of the global economy, when it reached 27.3% of the global economy. Now it's about something like about 18% uh, of the global uh, economy. Now, let me... Uh, lower, lower, oh. Can you get rid of that guy? <laughs> Eliminate him. Uh, right. Uh, this is th these figures I'm about to show you are actually based on Huang Gong, who's a professor at Tsinghua University. But there, I've you also used some other people as well, some Americans and so on, in putting this together. And this is the projection for the global economy in 2030. Now, you might think 2030 is a long way away. It's not. It's only 16 years away. That is not very long. And, the, and these are the projections about what proportion of the global economy these countries will see. Japan will be only 3%, uh, Russia only 3%, uh, Brazil 5%, uh, other Asian developing countries six, like Indonesia, Vietnam and so on, 6%. Uh, the EU, 13%. The United States, 15%. India, which I'm not going to talk about, really, 19%. And China, 34%. 34% of the global economy in 2030, over one third. The Chinese economy would be 
twice, more than twice the size of the American economy. It would be larger than the American economy and the EU combined. And bear in mind that even at this point in 2030, only 70, just over 70% of the Chinese population will be living in the urban areas. In other words, 29% will be living in the countryside and will still be essentially engaged in rural activity. In other words, even in 2030, the Chinese economy will still be in the latter stages of its economic takeoff, with still, therefore, a great deal of potential for, uh, for, for, for growth uh, and uh, development. So the point here is that the weight of the Chinese economy in the global economy is going to be quite historically exceptional. It's going to be far greater than America at its peak, and it's going to have a great impact, much greater than that. We're only just, we're just seeing the very beginnings of it. Now. This, is just, this is just toe in the water stuff now. It's going to be much more important uh, than that. Now, the conclusion that I would draw from this is if we want to understand, well, what kind of global power is China going to be? How will it exercise its power and so on? My first point is its exercise, it will have disproportionate economic influence, disproportionate economic weight in the global economy, much bigger than the United States has ever enjoyed, much bigger than Britain before that enjoyed. So my first point really is that the, the, the to understand China's influence as a great power, first and foremost, it's going to be about its sheer economic scale. What about political and military? How do we understand this? Well, I've talked about Europe and colonization and empires and so on. Let me just say something briefly about the United States. Because the United States is not a replica of Europe, but of course, essentially, America came from Europe, borrowed a great deal from, obviously, inevitably, inherited, not borrowed, inherited the European experience and had many European attitudes. So the American attitude towards the world was shaped by, you know, the frontier spirit, which was essentially uh, the frontier moving westwards and the process of conquest and so on, or buying up land uh, which, by which America expanded to the western seaboard and then across uh, the Pacific. It had a very strong sense of destiny. Um, it saw itself as a model for others. I mean, the Americans think of themselves in terms of manifest destiny. The Constitution as something which is a model for countries uh, throughout uh, the world. And uh, I think that helps to explain why the Americans are so good at lecturing and hectoring everyone else to be like themselves, and not least the Chinese. But the Chinese are too wise to uh, follow the Americans in this context. So, um, uh, so America actually, on this basis, uh, if you look at the period since 1945, I mean, really developed uh, uh, some characteristics which have defined America as a great power. And they are, first, the sort of building a network of alliances around the world. I mean, it's, it's an interesting fact that China doesn't have any allies. Discuss. Is this a strength? or a weakness, or just a profound difference in the way China sees itself and the rest of the world. But for the Americans, it tells us a lot. Because essentially, the American philosophy has been, there's always an enemy. In the Cold War, it's the Soviet Union. But it, it, now the Soviet Union's passed, although Russia is still seemingly an enemy. But it's a, a, a worldview built around the concept of alliance, allies and enemies. And also, I mean, a huge military commitment. I mean, it is, to me, extraordinary that the United States today 
spends half the world's budget, military budget. It's responsible for around 50% of total global military expenditure. So what about China? Do we expect China to move along these lines? I don't. I really don't think China will be like this. I just don't think China will move in this kind of way. Firstly, I don't think really China's ever been, has never really majored on military prowess. I mean, at any period of its history, it's not really been, you know, the, it's, it's, it, it, the military, its military capacity has never been that important to China. I mean, if you look in this region, well, there was only one country in the modern period which stands out as a, as a, a, like this, and that is Japan, after the Meiji Restoration, when it became a voracious and aggressive uh, colonial power in the same manner as the Europeans. But the Chinese have never really been like that, and they never colonized. I mean, they, they, didn't, they did not colonize this region. They did not colonize Southeast Asia and so on. So they had no tradition, military tradition uh, of that kind either. And if you look at, well, look at the, the figures. I, oh, we've, never mind. We don't need to worry about that. Um, if you look at uh, China's military expenditure, uh, this is since 1989 to 2012, uh, and the Chinese. Th th this is the Chinese line here, going up, there, and this is America, and these are France, Germany, UK, uh, Japan. And what is striking, really, m remember that we're we're moving to a situation where the Chinese economy is almost the same size as the American economy. Uh, and the Chinese military expenditure is much lower. I mean, this is very different, as I said earlier, suggested earlier, from the experience of the Soviet Union. Or if you look at uh, military expenditure per capita, then, you know, there's China. And there's the USA. And, you know, very interestingly, under Deng Xiaoping, I mean, there was a very clear emphasis under Deng Xiaoping that military expenditure would be held. And you could see that from the previous one. I mean, you know, for a long period, military expenditure barely increased in China. Now, it's increasing more now, but I don't think the Chinese are going to, and I don't think they should, by the way. I don't think they should go along the Soviet path. They should not compete with the United States militarily, and I don't expect China to do that. Now, what about politically? I mean, you know, the, the Western tradition, first Europe and then the United States, um, are, uh, have got a long record and a very frequent record of interference in the affairs of other countries. Um, regime change is the modern word for it. We, it used to be more like coup d'etat in the, in the 50s and 60s. Will China move along this ro road? I don't think so. I don't think so. The Chinese tradition is very different. I mean, the Chinese tradition, in a sense, is quite aloof. The Middle Kingdom tradition is quite sort of abstracted. It's quite removed. It doesn't see itself as interfering in the affairs of other countries. It didn't essentially interfere in the affairs of the tribute states. And if you look at the patterns uh, in this region, aside from Mao's little revolutionary um, uh, adventures here uh, in you know, odd places, Basically, modern China, um, especially since Deng Xiaoping, has not interfered in the affairs of, uh, um, uh, of countries in this region. Um, it's let them get on with it. It doesn't see the way, the way it operates is very different from that. It's a very, it's, it's a, it's, it's a non-intrusive uh, 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 way of relating to countries, even uh, countries, of course, in the case of Southeast Asia, that are much smaller uh, than, uh, than themselves. Um, so I, I think that, and I, uh, if you take Africa, I mean, Africa is another good example. You know, China's become very involved in Africa, and basically the Chinese have not tried to sort of, you know, promote a faction. You know, the American embassy, classically in developing countries, was often the focus for who was going to be the next leader of the country because the Americans will pull the strings. I don't think the Chinese have done that, and I don't expect the Chinese to do that. I think it's very different. So, I've come to the point now where I want to say, 
How will China exercise its power as, as a global, uh, as a great global power, exercise influence? Well, so far I've really only drawn one conclusion, and that is economic. I don't think it will be politically or militarily intrusive in the way that the Western uh, powers have been. That brings me to my final point in this context, which is cultural. You see, China's greatness in its imperial period was exercised not just economically, but I would say perhaps even more important, culturally. But I think we could agree that at the moment there isn't much sign of China enjoying great cultural influence. In fact, one of the pe remarks that people often make, you know, is, oh, you know, China's got very little soft power compared with the United States, and it's got a long way to go, and so on. I I'll come back to that in a moment. But I think there are, I don't think, and I don't think we should expect the present situation to change that much in the near future. Why? One. Oh, we've gone backwards. I got overexcited. Um, China's poor. China's a poor country, relatively speaking, compared with Singapore, for example, or compared with Hong Kong, or compared with the rich world. Poor countries don't have much soft power. How many people in rich countries really want to go and exchange their standard of living and live in a poor country? Barely any. I mean, you can see this. I lived in Hong Kong for two and a half years. You know, the Hong Kong Chinese look down on the mainlanders. They were very, it was unpleasant, actually. Very arrogant towards them. You know, they thought they were poor and they were you know, uneducated and uncouth and so on. You know? And I, that attitude, unfortunately, I think is still quite prevalent in Hong Kong. And I imagine, you know, not many, I mean, I imagine, in fact, I was having a chat earlier on with someone here on Business China about, because she goes to, to, to China a lot, and I was asking her about the attitude uh, of the students that she takes from Singapore to China. And their initial reaction when they go, and when they're thinking about going is, what are the toilets like? Um, you know, what's life going to be like? What are the beds? Are the beds going to be comfortable? Will there be any beds? Well, maybe not that last point, but... Um, you know, it is... People in Germany don't aspire to live in Namibia. <laughs> in other words, I'm not just talking in Chinese terms. It's a more general point, okay? So, it's true that China is making strides forward in its standard of living. Look. At the moment, its standard of living is about, it's a bit over one-fifth of, a bit, a bit around one-fifth of the American standard of living. And by 2030, remember 2030, Chinese economy twice the size of the American economy, it'll be around about half the standard of living of, um, of, the, of the United States. So we've got to think of this uh, as over a period, you know? We've got to think of this taking place over a period. But the, the, that as China gets wealthier, it will become more attractive. And of course, it is true also, as I was in my discussion I was having earlier. Ah, but what did the Singaporean students think? Because the last trip was to Shanghai. I said, they must have been quite impressed by Shanghai. Because any of you who've been to Shanghai know that in some ways it's rather more modern than Singapore. True? So she said, well, she said what you said. <laughs> Is there. So, um, so we're going to see a complicated pattern, okay? Just as amongst the Hong Kong Chinese, there's going to be a complicated pattern, by the way, about their attitudes, because some of the attitudes are shifting, because they used to think of the mainlanders as having no money, and then the mainland tourists now, some of them have got a lot more money than even the Hong Kong tycoons. So they're having to revise their thinking a little bit as they go along. But basically, I think this does provide something of a ceiling, a constraint on China's appeal, that while it's still a relatively poor developing country, it can't exercise great cultural influence. There's a second reason why China can't exercise easily cultural influence, or if you want to use the term soft power, fair enough. And that is 
that for the last 200 years, since the British Industrial Revolution, since in a way the modern world began in that form, it has been dominated by the West. Until Japan came along, there were only European countries, plus um, uh, those countries that Europe gave birth to, like the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and so on. There were only Western countries. So, the world is, in, has been immersed in Western influence. The West has enjoyed an extraordinary hegemony over the world. And in this very same period of the last 200 years, as you know, China did very badly because the rise of the West in this modern form coincide almost exactly with the beginnings of Chinese decline and the century of humiliation. So China's not been a player. So no one knows anything about, I mean, this is an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? No one knows anything about China compared with what they know about the West. They know all about Hollywood films. They don't know much about Chinese films. Right? They know New York because they've seen it in a thousand films. But they don't really know much about Beijing. English became the lingua franca. Now there's a rush, a race to learn Mandarin. But it's, you know, we're talking about being a very, very long way behind. So that's the second reason, I think, why it's going to be very difficult uh, for China to exercise cultural influence. I said very difficult. I didn't say impossible. But it's going to take time. And the third reason why it's going to be difficult for China to exercise cultural influence is this. China is only, what should we say, halfway through its economic takeoff, halfway through its industrial revolution. So therefore, culturally speaking, in terms of its appeal, in terms of its self-confidence, in terms of its self-awareness, Chinese culture in a modern context is only, can only be regarded as work in progress. And this is a complicated question because you could also say that the Chinese, you know, half the, half the Chinese, a bit under half the Chinese, still live in the countryside. So the modernization of the Chinese identity has got a long way to go and ultimately the appeal of a people is the appeal you know is the appeal of, of the Chinese identity and how people interpret it and respond to it and feel some maybe affinity with it or whatever or impressed by it so that's another reason why there's a long way to go but 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 in the long run I think China will become I must say a huge cultural influence I do think that. And I can, I'm always slightly mystified and by people who think, well, America is culturally rich and China's culturally poor. Excuse me. I mean, you must be poor talking just in terms of pop culture. You're not talking about culture in the big sense of the term. History of the state, governance, traditions, social relationships, the hinterland of a country. America is very recent. China is very old. China brings to the party an extraordinary, brings to the global party an extraordinary and great history of civilizations and inventions and the rest of it. But it needs to be translated into a modern form in a modern context. So that's what I expect us to see. When? Well, let me suggest to you, you can already just glimpse it. We're just at the beginning of the process, but you can already just glimpse it. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first, one of the great uh, values of Chinese civilization, of course, is about education. It's about the place of education in society, the importance of education. This is something which is born generation after generation down the ages by Chinese parents, and especially, I suspect, Chinese mothers. The importance of education. It's true in Singapore as well, of course. Now, there's that bloke again. I can't get rid of him. Um, now, let me just draw your attention. This is the OECD PISA Global Survey Education. Um, these are 2012, and there was another one in 2010. Now, you'll see at the top, 
in both cases, though, it's just to show how modern I am. There we are. You see Shanghai. Shanghai? Shanghai. There's you, Singapore. 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 Not bad, eh? And then, you'll, but you'll see clustered around the top of the Confucian countries. Um, if you want me to wear sackcloth and ashes, UK. UK. <laughs> UK. I haven't yet decided to emigrate, but, you know, there is a case. Um, so, you know, there's a very great interest in this in the West. In 2010 and 2012, when I was in America in 2010 when these results came out, and I was in the UK when they came out for 2012. And what was really striking was how much coverage there was in the newspapers, on television, and so on, about the significance of these results. Because every country knows now, and I knew Singapore has you know, been very, very uh, uh, alert on this question, that the quality of the education, the quality of the students who turn out is extremely important to a nation's success. And this is the debate. Now, why does Shanghai do well? Or why, why do all these countries do well? But I'm talking about Shanghai because Shanghai's top in every case and, uh, you know, well clear of anyone else in each case. Well, it is true that they've made some important reforms. So the, the, the move away from rote learning and some in interesting experiments being going on in Shanghai schools. The other reason, though, is much more general, isn't it? It is the cultural inheritance, the cultural attitude towards education. And that's something you can't transplant. But it is something which is, in my view, a, a kind of civilizational characteristic of China and the Chinese more generally, the Chinese diaspora. Very, very important. And so the world is looking at this, is interested in it. So here already you can see, in the field of education, such an important area now, even though China is still a poor developing country, what can we learn from China? That is the question that's being asked. You know, the Ministry of Education in Britain, Department of Education, sent a load of teachers over and, and senior education administrations over to Shanghai to try and find out what they could learn. It's a long time since the British thought they could learn anything from the Chinese. Um, but that is something we're witnessing. Now, the other point I want to make about something different happening you'll be more surprised by it. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not in Singapore, but you might be more surprised by it. And that is what Westerners think is the great Achilles heel of China. Why economic growth will come to an end, why it's just a matter of time before China hits the wall. Governance. The Chinese state is unsustainable. This has been, this is the mentality. This is very widespread thinking. Yeah? Very, very widespread thinking. Not just in the West, but elsewhere as well. I don't agree with them. I have to say to them, I don't agree with this view. I do not agree with it. I think that Chinese government is what the state is one of the great strengths of China. It is true. And when the state is not working in China, as it happened in the period of the century of humiliation from the, um, the 1850s to 1949, then the state was, was indeed hopeless. But one of the great achievements of Mao was to put the thing together again, reconstitute the state, and once more in China, the state is an extremely effective institution. It's capable of strategic thinking. It's capable of... Uh, uh, huge infrastructural projects in a way that uh, the rest of the world has slowly really come to respect and admire. A governance crisis? I don't think so. I mean, if you're asking me, does governance in China need to be reformed? Yes, of course it does. But it's been in a process of reform for the last 20 or so years, since, well, longer since Deng Xiaoping, really. Constant reform. Constant re-engineering, constant repurposing of the state has been going on in China. But China clearly works. It delivers. Everyone's saying, well, you know, they must be doing something right because look how they achieved it. And the state is absolutely central to this process. 
And I think my view about China is as it continues to grow, as standard of livings continue to rise very rap uh, pretty rapidly or very rapidly, then actually the political elites in China are going to enjoy not declining legitimacy, but rising legitimacy over the next 10, 20 years. So I just, I think that the way West, the Westerners think about it, it I, is the wrong way around. I think they've got it wrong. They're right, there is going to be a governance crisis, but do you know where it's going to be? It's going to be in the West. You can see it already in Europe. Apart from Germany, virtually every political elite in, the, in Europe is in crisis. Why? Because the economy is stagnating. Because they don't know where to go. Because Europe is in precipitous decline. And the population is very uh, restless about it. And it is looking for alternatives. Some of the alternatives are, you know, are, are dangerous alternatives. The far right, uh, uh, xenophobia, racism, and so on. But there is a growing crisis of governance in Europe. And there is also a crisis of governance, in my view, in the United States. Because there is now a lack of strategic consensus in the United States about the future. It's po the, the politics in the United States is polarized. So far from, the, in my view, the, China, the, 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 the state being the problem in China, I think the, the state is, is actually a great strength of China. And we will see this not just in the context of China, but on a global basis as China continues to rise and the Western countries continue uh, to uh, decline. Now, there we are then. That's what I think. So I'm just going to finish by making some points about the international system. Because as China rises as a great power, then it has implications for the nature of the international system. Now, some people like John Eikenberry, they argue, well, the American international, the American inspired international system is eternal. It will last forever. As you know, nothing lasts forever. And uh, I think that as America declines, the, Ameri the, the American inspired international system that we live with now will decline, fragment, and ultimately become something different, is, is my view. Just like the international system under Pax Britannica, the Brit British hegemony, where is it now? Basically, it disappeared. Basically, it, 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 it collapsed uh, uh, over time. So I think we will see a, a new international system. And you can see the beginnings of this process now. You see, look, what, you remember the G7? Just about, huh? It's not long ago replaced by the G20. <laughs> and the WTO, which was one of the big organizations of the, the US era, it used to be called GATT, and now the Americans can't really get their way uh, in the WTO. This is one of the reasons you're getting the development of all kinds of regional and bilateral trading blocks. World Bank, one of the two original institutions of the American world order. What's happening to the World Bank? Well, let me, let me just hop along here to the next. It doesn't work so well, but never mind. Right. In 2009 and 2010, the China Development Bank and the China Export Import Bank gave, lent more to the developing world than the World Bank. Just two Chinese institutions, right? So go back to where I was, back to the World Bank. It's not only the China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank, but it, now it's the BRICS Development Bank, which was formed earlier this year or last year. I, I think it's the earlier this year, but never mind. Um, which has got a paid-up capital of, I think, 100, I think it's $50 billion. And uh, uh, now, of course, just launched the Asia uh, infrastructure Investment Bank, and I'll come back to this, 21 countries in this region signed up to it. I'm sorry, the World Bank is going to become very quickly a marginal institution because it doesn't have these kinds of funds. 
the sponsors and funders of the World Bank are the developed countries and they ain't got no money. So they, the World Bank's future is increasingly, it seems to me, as a secondary institution. What about the IMF? Well, the IMF is now, of course, for the same reason as I just said, like for the World Bank, is also uh, much less important uh, than it used to be. And I think the future, I, I, I must say I put a question mark uh, against the long-term future of the IMF. If it reformed, and the Chinese, I think, were trying to support reform, then that's a different matter. Look, the problem is that there is huge resistance within the, within, within the Western countries to reforming the World Bank. So you still got a situation where China has less voting rights in the IMF than Belgium. And as far as I know, Belgium's got a population of about 7 or 8 million, and China has a population of 1.3 billion. So there's something wrong arithmetically there somewhere. So I think that, that, uh, that um, <coughs> we're, we're the, the, the future of the IMF is most unclear. East Asia, I'm going to come to that again in a moment. But East Asia, I'll just make state the general proposition. It was your US centric. It is becoming increasingly China centric. Irresistible momentum in my view. And then, of course, in the longer run, we're going to see the renminbi uh, as, as, as the, the main, uh, as the dominant global currency when it's a reserve currency. And the global financial center, I think, will move from New York to Shanghai. Not imminently, 20 years' time, 25 years' time. Maybe I'm being, maybe that's too long, but, you know, some, anyway, think, think, think longer term. So, we are witnessing, with the center of gravity of the global economy shifting from west to east, the erosion of the existing international system, willy-nilly, and the emergence of a new global system, above all because of China, but not only because of China. The other reason is the rise of the developing world in general, which includes China, and the decline of the developed world. If I gave you the, this, this circle, for the mid 1970s, this would be this would be the north, and this would be the south. Two thirds of the global economy was counted for by the developed world, and now it's been reversed. And what's driving the new what's driving the global the the, the, the demand for a new international system, uh, of which China, of course, is the most important player, is this this profound change uh, in uh, the global uh, system. Now, I think I need to say, before I finish, something about East Asia. Look, what I want to say about East Asia is this. East Asia, it, it, you, you can't understand the international system as something which sort of is, you know, uh, someone's drawn uh, with a set of institutions, and it has no relationship to the rest of the world. The international system rests on all the regions of the world. So if something's changing profoundly in one region, and in another, then it's going to affect what the nature of the international system is. And the fact is that East Asia is now the most important region in the world, global uh, economic region in the world, the largest. Now, as you know, the Americans were very worried because they'd been losing ground in the first decade or so, or lo longer than that, of this century to China. And they had rapidly been losing ground. So you remember the pivot now called rebalancing. Now, I have always, to be quite honest with you, thought that the pivot would fail. And I thought it would fail because the reason for China's growing influence and America's declining influence in the region is economic. That's the reason. That China, from having no no, no country in the region would have counted China as their, its largest export market uh, around about late 80s, uh, late um, 1980s. Today, virtually, not quite, but virtually every country in East Asia now counts China as their biggest export market and their biggest trading partner. And what's happened to America? Well, America has roughly gone to where China was uh, about uh, 15 years ago. Now, how do you tackle that problem? Well, of course, the Americans have a mindset. The American mindset is, ha, military alliances. 
that's the answer the Americans give. That's the answer the Americans, that's the way they think. So what's the first priority? It is to strengthen the alliances with Japan, with South Korea. Try and cuddle up a bit more again to the Philippines. This isn't going to reverse the situation. I'm sorry, this, this, is, this is the way in which America still thinks in old ways. It still thinks in terms of Cold War mentality. But we're not living in a Cold War world. Much as some people would wish we were, but we're not. Because China's not playing that game. Whereas Americans, you know, they're talking about allies and exclusivity, TPP, you know, exclude China and so on. The Chinese approach is the opposite. The Chinese approach is an inclusive approach. And it's not a military approach. It's an economic approach. It's a win-win. It's, we need a partnership. So you get the latest development, which I think is sounding... This, I, th this, I think, in, is an intimation, an intimation of the death knell of the American pivot. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. What is the Chinese thinking here? The Chinese thinking is that what we need, that, that the infrastructure needs huge investment in this part of the world, uh, and we will create, along with others, an institution which enables enormous investment to take place. I mean, there's no way Thailand could afford a high-speed rail system link, there's no way Laos could, there's no way Cambodia is, could, there's no way probably Malaysia could, but with a sort of Chinese martial aid, it might be possible to achieve this. And I think this is the Chinese thinking uh, in relationship to this. The Americans, what was the American attitude towards this? The Americans lobbied, as you may have read, intensively to persuade countries in this region not to sign up to the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. But 21 countries, all the countries colored red here, joined up. There were four countries that didn't join up. Australia, well, under what's his face, Abbott, not so surprising. <laughs> Japan, I don't need to elaborate. It's obvious that the Japanese under Abe are not going to join it. So you're left with two countries that didn't join up. Indonesia, Indonesia as I understand it, is going to join. That just leaves South Korea. And South Korea is getting, as you know, closer and closer to China. But it's got a lot of American troops there, and it's got very strong historic ties. And it's just signed a free trade agreement with China. So I think it's a matter of time before South Korea signs up. So where does that leave the Americans? I mean, the Americans are isolated in relationship to this. So I've, I've more or less finished. I just want to say this by way of finally wrapping up. You've got to understand, the Chinese are pragmatic. They're incremental. There, ain't, there aren't going to be great apocalyptic changes. There are not going to be any cataclysmic changes. They're not against the existing international system. On the contrary, the Chinese have got a lot from the Deng Xiaoping strategy of saying we need to be part of the international system. We can't carry on with the autarkic road on which Mao uh, had operated. We need to join, join the world. And so for them, you know, the big, big turning point was membership of the WTO in 2001 and so on. So that's where they stand. But they ain't like the Americans because they recognize that the ownership of the system, the landlord of this system, is the United States. The United States, therefore, has a different attitude towards it. The Chinese attitude is much more pragmatic. It's contingent. If it works, good. We like it and will operate by the rules, as the Chinese have in the WTO and so on. No one, barely anyone criticizes them for not pulling their, pulling their weight in the sense of operating by the rules of the institutions of which they're part. But, it's not an unconditional relationship. It's not one that will carry on willy-nilly in the existing form. On the contrary, where the Chinese think there's a problem, 
then they will make a proposal. So they want reform of the IMF. No reform of the IMF. Not very little reform of the World Bank. So you will see the BRICS Development Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, and so on, being, being formed. And this, of course, will change the nature of the international system. But don't expect it to be some kind of revolutionary act. Uh, the Chinese will be very cautious, quite rightly, and they will be very non-provocative. I think I've come to an end. Thank you.